a book was published uh, in the spring last year uh, entitled You're a Miracle. The author stated his purpose in writing it with these words. I want to start you on a journey that ends with you looking in the mirror one day, unable to hold back the tears, because instead of seeing someone who isn't tall, thin, young or attractive enough, you instead see a profound and rare being who is worthy of love. I want you to see yourself and be awed because you are truly awesome. A professing Christian who wrote the book. That is not the journey that God takes Joseph's brothers on in this chapter. His aim is to have them look in the mirror, unable to hold back the tears as they see themselves and feel awful because they are truly awful. They're not awesome. They are awful. And God is at work to bring them on that journey to see themselves as he sees them. It's not about self-acceptance. That's the buzzword these days, isn't it? No, God wants them to come face to face with who they are and what they've done. They claim, uh, 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 and it's a theme that runs through the chapter, they're, they're honest men. Well, I think there are four cons that suggest otherwise. First of all, confrontation. Here's the first con. Confrontation, this occurs, I think, in verses 1 to 17. God will have them face their sin. He will not allow them to go on ignoring it. They must confront it. And God is going to confront them with their sin. And I think that's seen in a number of ways in these early verses. First of all, they need to go to Egypt. Egypt, as we saw last week, was the granary of the ancient world. So when there was a famine in Abraham's day, what does he do in chapter 12? He goes to Egypt. When there's a famine in Isaac's day, he's inclined to go to Egypt, and God tells him uh, not to. Uh, chapter 26, he directs him elsewhere uh, to uh, the Philistines. Why had the brothers not set out to the granary of the ancient world? Why hadn't they gone to Egypt to get provision as the famine begins to bite? As Jacob asked them, why do you just keep looking at each other? These aren't brothers who are normally indecisive. We saw that in Shechem. Uh, they certainly were very decisive then. They were very decisive in their treatment of Joseph. These aren't undecisive, indecisive uh, men. You see, Egypt had guilty associations for these brothers. They had sold Joseph to Ishmaelite traders headed for Egypt. Going to Egypt would mean they would have to take the exact route that Joseph had taken when they sold him as a slave to those Ishmaelites. They're not in a hurry to go to Egypt uh, because it's got those guilty associations for them, surely. But then also uh, they set out, the ten brothers uh, set out to buy grain from Egypt. It's interesting, they're Joseph's brothers uh, who set out. Uh, Joseph is the governor of the land in verse 6, uh, the one who sold grain to all its people. Uh, it's interesting, that we, we know that he uh, set up uh, uh, grain stores in each city. Uh, so whether, uh, so the people in each area would be able to buy grain. So whether foreigners who came went to a certain central place uh, where Joseph uh, would be uh, uh, overseeing the sale of grain to uh, foreigners. That may have been the case, uh, but they, uh, Joseph is there. When his brothers arrived, verse uh, 6, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Uh, Joseph is now an Egyptian. Uh, he's probably clean-shaven and may, perhaps completely shaven. That was a, a style in Egypt. Uh, uh, they would have been bearded, that was their that style of Asiatics, uh, and so they didn't recognize him, he's in Egyptian garb, uh, and he's, uh, as we find later, he's speaking through an interpreter, they've got no idea 
he recognizes them. He pretends to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. In chapter 37 uh, and verse 4, we read of these brothers. When his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than any of them, this is chapter 37 and verse 4, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. <laughs> now Joseph speaks harshly to them. That's how they spoke to Joseph. They, can, they couldn't speak kindly to Joseph. They were always harsh whenever they spoke to Joseph. Now that's how Joseph speaks to them. He speaks harshly to them. And then they are accused of being spies. Uh, and that comes repeatedly, isn't it? You are spies. Verse 9, you have come to see uh, where our land is unprotected. Uh, no, they're not. They say, verse 12, no, he says, you have come to see where our land is uh, unprotected. It's just as I told you, you are spies. It repeatedly, boom, boom, you are spies. But again, isn't that how they viewed Joseph? Back in chapter 37 again. Uh, notice what we read in chapter 37. This is the account of Jacob, verse 2. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhar and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. <laughs> and then later in the chapter, uh, chapter 37, when his brothers had gone to uh, take the flocks to Shechem, uh, Jacob uh, uh, says to Joseph, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring back word to me. <laughs> I think they would have viewed Joseph as a spy. Well, here they are being accused of being spies. And then their pleas are unavailing. Uh, so um, Jacob, uh, Joseph, sorry, in verse 9 says, You are spies, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were twelve brothers, the sons of one man who live in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father. One is no more. Joseph said to them, it's just as I told you, you are spies. They're pleas are unavailing. Well, that's exactly what they recognise in verse 21 in this chapter. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life. But we would not listen. That's why this distress had come upon them. They weren't listened to. Well, that's exactly how they treated Joseph. They hadn't listened to Joseph with his pleas for mercy as they sold him to those Ishmaelites. Liam Golliger uh, has got an excellent little book on uh, uh, Joseph, uh, The Hidden Hand of God, I think is the subtitle. He says this, God, through Joseph, can be seen pressing on the pus point of sin in their lives. Very vivid, isn't it? But that's what God's doing uh, through Joseph. I, I, I don't think we can be sure of what Joseph's motives are here, but God is using Joseph to press on the pus point of sin in their lives. Are they really the honest men they claim to be? Well, God wants to confront them with the fact that they're not. So God wants to confront them with their sin and uh, the way that Joseph deals with them is confronting them with their sin uh, uh, and what they've done. And so they're thrown into custody for three days, three days of contemplation. <laughs> ah, what was going through their minds uh, as this drama unfolded? What did they, did they speak to each other? We don't know. But here he is confrontation uh, and that's what God will do uh, uh, God confronts people with who they are and what they're like and what they've done uh, and so that's what's happening uh, confrontation but secondly confession here's the second con confession in verses 18 to 24 uh, so Joseph uh, puts him in prison um, you send one of your brothers back 
uh, uh, to uh, get your youngest brother. Uh, and uh, if he comes back, then uh, yeah, y- uh, y- your word is verified, you're free. But on the third day, we read in verse 18, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back to your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. So the plan is now changed. Instead of all staying in prison and one going to fetch Benjamin, now one stays in prison as a hostage uh, and the others can go because they can take grain back to the starving household so that the households don't suffer uh, and uh, then they can return with Benjamin. But Joseph's change of plan is introduced by a very searching statement there in verse 18. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. See, the clear implication is that the fear of God will prevent a person acting unjustly and cruelly. (laughs) I'm going to change what I have planned to do because that is unjust and cruel, to keep you all in prison, to send one back. There won't be enough supplies for the rest of the families back there, if if your story is true. I'm not going to act unjustly and cruelly because I fear God. Now, again, that's God putting his finger on the puss point, isn't it? Is, do you fear God? In the way you treated me, Joseph is saying, do you, did you fear God? You were cruel and unjust. Well, Joseph ups the ante by stating clearly that failure to produce their youngest brother will mean death. Verse 20, but you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This is the first time that the death penalty has been pronounced. Your spies will be in prison. But now he says, if you don't bring him, you will die. Again, Liam Golliger says, the severity of the way these men are being handled awakens their consciences in a way that a brother's cries and a father's distress had never done. Joseph pleading with them not to treat him like they did. Jacob's sorrow and grief when they brought Joseph's robe back, bloodstained, that didn't affect them. But now their consciences are being awoken. And that's very clear in what happens in verse 21, isn't it? Here is their confession. They said to one another, or a man to his brother, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. Is this the first time that these brothers have spoken about Joseph out loud together? It might have been. And they all trace the present situation to how they treated Joseph. They said to one another, again, it's a man to his brother. They all recognise that uh, uh, their present situation is on account of how they treated Joseph. We are on the receiving end of what we dished out. Surely we are, surely we are being punished The term in Hebrew, uh, one writer tells us, reflects both the guilt and punishment that have come on them. So the ESV, the New King James, the New American Standard, all says we are guilty because of our brother. And the the word can be used in both senses. It's it's only used on two other occasions, and it's guilt that is prominent uh, there. It's about uh, their feeling uh, guilt. And guilt is heightened because of what Reuben says there in verse 22. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. Their guilt is heightened because Reuben urged them not to sin against Joseph, the boy, the lad. Uh, That emphasizes again their guilt that he was just a lad. What were we doing? Why didn't you listen? 
here is a confession of guilt. They did not realize, verse 23, that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep. So you can see the emotion of the situation. This is the first of seven occasions uh, as we work through the rest of Genesis where Joseph weeps. It's an interesting study for you to see these occasions when Joseph weeps. The, the emotion there as he uh, hears uh, Reuben's words, as he hears his brothers recognize their guilt and the punishment that they are receiving. And notice it, it is tit for tat. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. We saw his distress, we ignored it. Now we are being distressed. And so confrontation uh, with their sin, uh, a confession of their guilt, but then notice, thirdly, a consciousness of God. This is in verses 25 to 28. While their confession was good, it was not yet sufficient. Because there is no reference to God and God's retributive justice. This could have been karma. This is the universe dealing with us. No, no. They've got to recognise that God is at work. And this is what happens in this next uh, point of the journey that God is taking them on. On the journey home, silver is found in one of their sacks. Uh, Joseph gives orders uh, to have the sacks filled with grain uh, and to put the silver back in the sacks uh, they make, and gives them provision for their journey. They loaded their grain on the donkeys left at the place, verse 27, where they stopped for the night. One of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank and they turned to each other trembling and said, what is this that God has done to us? Their hearts sank or failed. Literally, their hearts went out. <laughs> they completely lost heart. Their last remaining courage left them and they trembled. What is this that God has done to us? Whatever uh, human agency was at work, they recognise that God is having dealings with them. It literally wasn't God who put the silver in the mouth. Someone, some person did that. But now they recognise that God is involved and God is having dealings with them and shaking them. It's the first time in the whole story of this family, that the brothers refer to God. <laughs> this is the first time that God appears on their lips. But why do they react in the way that they do? Their hearts sank, they trembled. What is God dealing with us? Uh, Thomas Fuller says, a guilty conscience is like a whirlpool drawing all to itself, which would otherwise pass by. <laughs> so that now the silver becomes something that makes them feel uh, guilt. I think it's related to the fact that they'd claim to be honest men. We are honest men. But the silver in the sack would suggest otherwise. Here is evidence that they're not the honest men they claim to be. That's why their hearts sink and they tremble in the way they do. But it's this consciousness now of God up to this, they'd suppress that in going about their business. And don't forget, this is 20 years since they sold Joseph. He was taken into slavery. They sold him when he was 17. And then he appears before Pharaoh when he's 30. So that's 13 years. The seven years of plenty have happened. So we're 20 years, perhaps 21 years. And they've gone on as if uh, that's done. Whatever we did, it's behind them. But no, no, now they're confronted with this sin. They make confession of it. And they're conscious now that God is dealing with them because of it. So there's confrontation, confession, consciousness of God, and then consternation. 
at the end of the chapter, verses 29 and onwards. Uh, they return uh, home to Jacob in Canaan. Uh, they relate to him uh, what has happened uh, and how they have been treated uh, by the uh, master, the Lord, in Egypt uh, and uh, uh, what he has uh, demanded regarding the return of their youngest brother. Verse 35, as they were emptying their sacks, there in each man's sack was his pouch of silver. When they and their father saw the money pouches, they were frightened. They were afraid. They discover all the silver is present, not just one man's silver that they discovered on the journey. Now all the silver is returned. And this is a serious problem that weighs on them. Uh, and so in the next chapter, uh, when they prepare to go back uh, to Egypt the second time, verse 12 of the next chapter, Jacob says, take double the amount of silver with you, for you must return the silver that was put into the mouths of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. Uh, and then uh, the brothers in verse uh, 18 of chapter 43, uh, now the men were frightened when they were taken to Joseph's house. Uh, they thought we are brought here because of the silver that was put into our sacks the first time. He wants to attack us and overpower us and seize us as his slaves and take our donkeys. This caused consternation. Uh, uh, this, uh, the, the danger is now very real uh, that they are found out. And uh, Simeon, what will become of Simeon? What will become of them? Uh, Joseph had threatened death if their words were not uh, verified. They thought that they could sin with impunity. 21 years, it seems, oh, it's, everything's all right. There's no problem. But now there's consternation. They'd ignored their guilt for 21 years, but now they can't ignore it. And they are afraid and frightened. Uh, Jacob, you have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more and now you want to take Benjamin, everything is against me. It seems as if he's given up on Simeon because of the silver that is now found. But uh, as uh, the commentator Leopold says, Jacob, in saying this, you have deprived me of my children, hits closer to the truth than he guessed when he charges his sons with being the ones making him childless, how the sons must have winced at the charge. They had deprived him of Joseph. Jacob didn't know that. But they are the ones who were guilty. And the emotional pressure is increased. Reuben uh, uh, offers to uh, make his sons uh, as uh, uh, guarantees. You may put both of my sons to death. If I do not bring him back to you, it's a foolish request, isn't it? How can grandsons compensate for sons? And, uh, but again, the emotion and the grief that they've caused is brought out very powerfully in verse 38. My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead and he is the only one left. That must have cut them, wasn't it? <laughs> well, what? But it, Jacob is revealing his grief. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my grey hair down to the grave in sorrow. The grief that they have caused Jacob is underlined for them afresh and anew uh, as he states the case here. And so God is at work. See, and it's important in this chapter, as it was with chapter 38 and that chapter about Judah, God is not only fulfilling his plan, he is also forming his people. God is fulfilling his plan to get the uh, family of Jacob down to Egypt, because then he's going to deliver them by that glorious uh, uh, salvation. That's all God's plan. God is fulfilling his plan, but God is forming his people. They need to understand how bad they are 
in order to understand their need of his forgiving and transforming grace. And God will bring them to see that so that they look in the mirror, uh, uh, as we thought at the beginning, unable to hold back the tears as they see themselves and feel awful because they are truly awful. A.W. Tozer says, man's great difficulty is that we have a religion without guilt. And religion without guilt just tries to make God a big pal of men. But religion without guilt is a religion that cannot escape hell, for it deceives and finally destroys all who have part of it. Confrontation, confession, a consciousness of God, consternation, these aren't pleasant. But they're absolutely necessary for these brothers and for those that God will make his people. He must bring us to see ourselves as we truly are. And if you haven't yet realised how bad you are, Pray that God will deal graciously with you uh, and yet reveal to you your true condition uh, in and of yourself. And then bring you to see that there is forgiveness and transforming grace in Jesus Christ. Uh, and he can uh, wash away your sin, as we've sung, in that sinless blood that he shed at Calvary. So don't try to avoid guilt. It's something that God is very good at using to form his people, to change and fashion them uh, to be for his glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the record of your dealings with these brothers. What a uh, miserable brood of uh, brothers they were. And yet, Lord, your grace in bringing them to see themselves. Lord, he hesitatingly, we do pray that you will continue to show us ourselves. Lord, and you are wise in how you will do that. But grant us, Lord, to have our eyes opened and our hearts and consciences uh, uh, awakened and to come to you as we are for your forgiving and transforming grace in Christ Jesus. Hear us, Lord, we pray, and form us according to your purpose. Amen. We're going to sing uh, the hymn, Come ye sinners, poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore, Jesus ready stands to heal you.